I want to thank you for tuning in to this worship service. Thank you so much for taking the time to dig into God's Word with us. Here at Highview, we exist to lead people to know and follow Jesus. And we'd love to invite you to come out to one of our services at one of our campuses. But we'd also love to, for you to check out Highview at highview.org. May you be blessed by our Lord as you dig into His Word to know and follow Jesus. Amen. How's everybody this morning? Really grateful for our music team who led us into just such a great focus that Jesus is the center, that his goodness is running after us. I don't know about you, but that cheers me up. So Pastor Scott, thank you very much for the opportunity to preach. It is a, it is a true privilege, and I'm so grateful, not only for this opportunity, but grateful for your leadership, brother. Just thanks for the way you allow God to work through you. It is uh, truly an honor that you are my family's pastor. So really grateful for that. Folks, I would like to invite you to stand. I'm uh, just going to read a few verses of scripture this morning. It's going to come from John chapter 4. Um, so stand if you're able, please. And uh, we'll just read verses 31 through 34 at this time. It starts by saying, Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. But Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Uh, my title message today is uh, a hunger to please God. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity you've given me uh, to be your mouthpiece and work through this text uh, that really tells us about the importance of having a hunger to please you. God, we have so many hungers that our flesh wants to satisfy, but I pray that what would be elevated above all else is that ultimate hunger to please you, the only one that can reward us with everlasting rewards. God, we pray that you will have your way in our lives and be the center of our lives as a result. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Please be seated. So if you're like me, you've probably experienced uh, a number of changes of perspective during your life. Um, sometimes it can happen before you even knew it, like trying a different food. You'll say, man, I used to like this, I don't like it anymore. And, and there's all kinds of changes that we go through. You know, I grew up in the state of Michigan, and I look back at my childhood often and think, where did that go? Where did that go? Um, you know, when we were kids in the summer, we would go, basically the house we would enter is the house we would be closest to, but we were all in each other's houses constantly. And if it was near mealtime, there was usually a mom that was welcoming to us to come in and get something to eat or drink, water or a popsicle, something. What was interesting was every time in my, in, in my neighborhood that you went to one of our friend's houses around lunchtime, if it was a ham sandwich on the table, if it was something else, you were gonna have a glass of whole milk with that food that you were eating. That's just the way it was. Dinner time, if you were coming to a friend's house around dinner time, it could be meatloaf and mashed potatoes, could have been spaghetti and salad, but there was gonna be a tall, clear glass of whole milk. Well, guess what, y'all? I can barely take two sips of that soup now. I mean, I just, I just have not had whole milk like that in a while, so it's very, very different for me. We're in a 2% household. We're my 2% milk people at. Uh, that's what we have in our fridge and have had for a while. You didn't expect a 2% milk shout out this morning, did you? But you got it. You got it. Um, I remember loving to play baseball. I played all three sports. Well, I played three sports. There's more than three, but I played football, basketball, and baseball um, during my high school days. But baseball was my main sport. Um, I played it all four years in the, at the varsity level. And we played about 30 games a spring. It was a, a busy, busy spring season. And in the summer, we turned around and played travel baseball. And it wasn't unlikely at all, those of you who played baseball or softball know, we played 50 to 60 games a summer, y'all. I mean, we were hopping. So I played 80 to 90 games of baseball um, all four years of my high school uh, career. And you might think, man, Pastor Dan, I know what you do with your free time all the time. You'd be wrong. I mean, I can barely watch one inning of baseball without falling asleep now. Now, disclaimer, I can fall asleep quickly doing just about anything nowadays, so that's not really all that much. But yeah, a little bit of change in perspective. One of the biggest changes in perspective I think I've experienced in my life from childhood to now is when I fall, y'all. When I was a kid and I'd fall, or in a sport when I'd dive for the ball, I'd pop right back up. I got so many compliments as a young man for my agility, for my, for my, for my get after it, want to. I popped right back up. People were always like, man, he's so agile. He just pops right back up to his feet. 
What y'all think I'm dealing with now? Man, I want to tell you that when I fall, the first thing I say is, oh no. And then after that, I pray. And I ask God for a strategy to get myself back on my feet. God, is there a ledge in the area? Is there a hand that can grab me? Um, those are the kind of things that go through my mind when I fall. You, I'm only kind of kidding, y'all. If I would have tripped and fell up these steps this morning, Pastor Scott would have had to tag back in and preach this morning. Or Sadiq, come on up and wrap it up. We're done for the day. I mean, I don't get up quickly or well. I have to check on which knee's not feeling good today that I need to start with to get back up, right? But you know, changes in perspective aren't all that bad. The greatest of changes in perspective are the ones that lead us to being more Christ-like, amen? The ones that lead us to being more like the person he created us to be. The, mon the ones that say, oh yeah, God, it's all about you, not me. I'm grateful that our God is so patient with us and is willing to change us into the people he created us to be. And I don't know about you, but I thought I'd be done by now, didn't you? I mean, when I was a younger Christian, I thought, this will take a few years and I'll be done. I'll be good. I'll be set. Graduate. God, use me however you want to use me. You ain't going to have no problems with me. I am shocked at how much I still need to learn, at how far I still need to go, at how much of, Christ, of, of true Christ-likeness I still need to march toward to actually obtain it. And that's going to be going on all of this life, and we'll own, I will only graduate when I enter into glory and I become just like him. You know, he is still showing me more and more ways that I can and should decrease. And he's still showing me more and more ways that he can and should increase in my life. He's showing me more and more ways that I should retire my selfish ambitions and should be more selflessly and faithfully involved in his mission. He's still showing me more ways that I should die to self and live for him. I'm still in school, y'all. You too? You know, today we're going to look at some of the changes of perspective that Jesus wanted to initiate. And by the way, those are the best kind of changes that can be initiated in your life. We're going to look at some of the changes that Jesus wanted to initiate in his disciples' lives. We're also going to look at some changes of perspective that Jesus wanted to initiate in the lives of a group of Samaritan people. We're also going to look at uh, some changes that Jesus wanted to initiate in the, lives of a, uh, uh, in the life of a Jewish official and his family members. And he's going to bring it back to us, too. Jesus wants to initiate changes of perspective in all of our lives. And we're going to see all of that through this text in uh, John chapter 4. But before we dig in, I want to ask you a question. It's not a trick question. But I would love you, a good show of hands would be great. Who in here would say, no trick, just straight up, I, without a doubt, 100% want to please God with my life? Who, who could raise their hand and just say, that's absolutely me? Nope, that's an easy one. Yes, thank you for showing your hands there. That is awesome. And the Bible uses a, a metaphorical word for that desire you have. It's the word hunger. God uses the word hunger often to describe the desire you and I have, but we don't, aren't always as engaged in as we need to be. God knows that we ought to have a hunger for God, but we can only please God if we have a hunger for God, so it is important that we study what it means to have a true hunger for God. So my friends, if you have a hunger for God or a hunger to please God, I wanna encourage you first and foremost to be fueled by obedience to God. Be fueled by obedience to God. Let's look back in history and we're gonna pick history up at the point where Jesus Christ had just led a Samaritan woman to faith in him. We're gonna look at John chapter four, verses 31 through 34 again, and we're gonna look at what this has to do with being fueled by obeying God. It says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus by saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his will. You see, John chapter four, verse eight tells us that the disciples had just returned from making a food run. You know, I love, I love a good food run. I don't know if I like to make the food run, but I, lo I love the person who makes the food run and brings the food back. So they had just made a food run. They brought food back. And what happened was they were bringing food back, not so much for them, but for Jesus. They were concerned about Jesus. That sounds weird to be concerned about Jesus, but because he chose to be not only 100% God, which he always has been, he also chose to be 100% man. That means that he experienced the sensations that we experience here on earth, a sensation like 
hunger. And you see, they were aware that he had been ministering and traveling all day, and they hadn't seen him eat that day. They were concerned for him in a normal, natural human sense. You haven't eaten, your energy's gotta be running low. As a matter of fact, the Bible lets us in on that in John chapter four, verse six, and tells us that he was weary. So that he was weary, they ran to get food, and they said a natural thing that anybody, any of your close ones would say to you. Hey, why don't you eat something? Why don't you get your energy up? Why don't, you, why don't you pause for a minute, get something to eat, and we can continue from there. They were looking out for their Lord and friend, nothing more, nothing less. Nothing sinister here. But it's interesting because if nothing is sinister here, if nothing's wrong with their request, if it's true that Jesus was both weary and hungry and food was available to him, the natural next verse we're gonna read is that he ate, right? Actually wrong. We learn here that Jesus elected not to eat, even though it wouldn't have been sinful for him to eat, but he still elected not to eat, and he simply wanted to use this as a teachable opportunity. You and I know that our Savior loves a good teachable moment. You and I wouldn't have typically seen this as a teachable moment, but he made it one, and he wanted to, he had different plans to address his hunger, his physical hunger at this time. You see, Jesus used his physical hunger at this time to urge his disciples to understand that there is another perspective you can have when it comes to this thing we call hunger. Jesus wanted them to know that he has a greater hunger to do his Father's will than to eat physical food. That may not be significant to you, but what about when you're starving for physical food? What about when physical food is available to you? Would you still say the same thing? I mean, I don't know. You and me probably look at this text and think, well, Jesus, why don't you just eat real quick and keep it moving? Like, what's the problem here? Well, Jesus is constantly working on his Father's will and accomplishing that, not the typical will that we have for ourselves. But he told them that by only thoroughly completing my Father's wishes will my hunger be satisfied. You see, he said Jesus previously proved this um, when he was in the wilderness. He was fasting and he was being tempted by the devil. Do you remember this? It's, it's, it's in Matthew chapter four, also in the book of Luke. And in Matthew four, it was a sinful solicitation that was happening. So different from what his disciples were encouraging him to do in John chapter four. Uh, it was sinful that, 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 well, let's put it this way. If Satan asks you to do anything, it's sinful because he's thoroughly sinful. Can, I just, can we just start there and make sure that's clear that you walk out with today? Yeah, absolutely. He was requesting for Jesus to turn stone into bread because he knew that Jesus was vulnerable. He knew he hadn't eaten. He knew he was weary and said, I can get him here because if you obey Satan anywhere, we no longer have a sinless savior, y'all. But Jesus knew what he was up to and he declined at that time. And he declined in a specific way. He didn't just say no. He said something more something that relates to John chapter four. In Matthew chapter four, verse four, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus turned a sinful temptation from Satan himself into a teachable moment. Who does that? I don't know about you, but I'm so busy fighting the temptation and often failing, I don't even know that I could make any of that a teachable moment. But Jesus always focused, always pure, always right, turned it into a teachable moment that benefits us here today. So where, what do we take, what's the takeaway from this? Even though John chapter four was about Jesus' disciples trying to help him while he was traveling, in Matthew chapter four was about uh, Satan trying to hurt him while fasting, Jesus declined food on both occasions. So what's wrong with food? What is it about food that we didn't know before we read this text? Are we not supposed to be eating, Lord? Is life supposed to be, uh, are we supposed to be on some kind of lifelong fast or something? No. Not at all. Jesus is not disparaging food at all. What he's disparaging is forgetting that we're ultimately here to please him. That's what he wants to elevate here. He wants to elevate the will of God as a greater thing to hunger for and a greater thing to seek to be filled by. Anyone else convicted by the implications of this mindset? I mean, I don't know about you, but if somebody said this to me at the table, not, not Jesus, not reading scripture, but if we're just sitting around eating and it's a good meal and we're conversing and somebody says, hey, y'all, I don't even want to take another bite. I'd rather go out and serve God. How about y'all? You say, hey, man, can you just pause on that for a little bit? Let us eat and then we can get back to that. Jesus is not trying to be headier than everybody else in the room. He's not trying to be this, oh, I can one-up you. I can show you how spiritual I am. There, this was not a flex at all. This was him saying, what are you focused on? What are you living for? What are you truly, mostly hungry for? 
Jesus put it all out there and said, if I had to choose, which I'm not telling you you have to choose in life, but if I had to choose, just putting these two things on the table, I love the will of my father more than food. He said that I would rather choose to eat, I mean, I would rather choose to fulfill my father's wishes than to eat the food that's sitting in front of me right now, guys. I just want you to know that. Let's put this scenario to the test in our own lives. And you're like, Dion, please don't. Please don't. I'm good. I'm good just listening. I don't need to think about that right now. Okay, let's start with the kids. We're going to go ahead anyway, all right? We may have most of our kids who are under 13 in children's ministry, but for those of you who are here, feel free to answer to yourselves. Parents, you can answer for your kids if they're not here. But if you're a kid under 13, I want to ask you this question. If you had to choose, which you don't, praise God, you don't, but if you had to choose, would you rather give up one birthday present, one Christmas present, or would you rather give up on obeying one of God's commands? What say you? Which would you rather give up on? Oh, teenagers, I'm coming for you now just to see what you think about this scenario. If you had to choose, uh, would you be willing to rather pass up on one compliment from a person you admire? Or would you rather be willing to pass up on obeying one of God's commands? Adults, you're next. Let's go. Let's go. Let's see where you're at with this. If you had to choose, would you be will- rather be willing to pass up on one extra paid vacation day from your job, or would you rather be willing to give up on obeying one of God's commands? Senior adults, get to a place to where life has allowed you some opportunities to do some of the things you always wanted to do when you were working much more earlier in life. Now you're working a little less and get to enjoy some of the things that you didn't get to do so much and hobbies become big, right? So would you be willing to, if you had to choose, would you rather pass up on one day of doing your favorite hobby or would you rather pass up on doing, uh, obeying one of God's commands? Did I ask you these questions to make you sweat? No. Did I ask you these questions to make you feel bad about yourself and the things that you desire? No. I asked you these questions because I wanted to put us all in a position to think like the disciples were asked to think at this moment in their lives. And what they were asked to remember or conclude or learn at this time was that nothing should be more precious to us than praying for or participating in God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. But sadly and often, many things are more precious to us than God's will. You know it, I know it, often. Think of the things we run to. Think of the things we chit chat about. Think of the posts that we frequent. I mean, our algorithm tells on us and throws things back at us that we've been liking throughout the week. And I wanna tell you that the algorithm's not constantly throwing things like Jesus is the center of it all at us. Why is God's will such a big deal? Like, what what is God's will that it deserves this prominent place in our lives? Well, let's talk about it. What is God's will for us? And I do mean us, because yes, there is such a thing as having a unique calling, unique God author calling in your life. We're not talking about that right now. What is God's collective will for us, the body of Christ, the children of God, the brothers and sisters in the Lord? What's his will for us? I'm gonna give you just a glimpse at some of it, first and foremost, spreading the gospel worldwide. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, we are all called to participate in that. We aren't all called to go to every country, but we are all called to participate in an effort that would get the gospel to every person on earth, including those in your neighborhood, including those in your home. Also, God's will for all of us is regularly discipling our fellow Christians. There should be a cyclical ministry going on in the body of Christ constantly, teaching one another to observe the commands that Christ has given, right? Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. What else is God's will for us? Helping needy people. Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10 tells us that we we, we, we are not to be the people who turn away every time we see a problem. We are to be the people who turn toward people when we see a problem. And God even ups the ante a little bit in verse 10 of Galatians 6 and says, especially those in your church who are struggling. Another part of God's will is loving everyone. Oh, that's easy. Move on, Dion. Including your enemies. Matthew chapter 4, 43 and 44, Jesus called it out of the culture and said, I know what you're thinking. Love everyone that you like. Love everyone that's nice to you. Love everyone that shows respect or loves you first. Nope, Jesus said love everybody, period. 
Matthew 22, verse 39 says that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves and our neighbors include our enemies. Another part of God's will is forgiving repentant people. Luke chapter 17, verse three, reminds us that God wants us to be unified in the body of Christ. He wants us to find ways back to each other. And one of the ways that we find ways back to each other is through forgiveness and forgiving people who have sinned against us, who recognize their sin, apologize for their sin. Now it's your turn. Forgive. That's part of God's will for us. Another part of God's will for us is praying for the leaders of our society. To which many of us respond, God, I ain't doing that. 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, we're called to pray for those who lead us, but we far more often complain about those who lead us. There's no verse in Scripture that says complain about those who lead you. There's a few verses that say pray for those who lead you. Another part of God's will for us is doing away with all idolatry. This is the one that gets us most. This is the one where we tell God, you can mind your business now. God says, no idols. And he sent his servants through other books of the Bible to remind us, hey, didn't God say no idols, y'all? And we think, oh, just a few, right? God's okay with a few. No idols. 1 John 5, 21, in this rich uh, book of content in 1 John, John, the Holy Spirit leads John to say as his last word in that book, do away with idols. That's God's will for all of us. That doesn't leave anybody in the room out of this discussion. And these are just a few of the things that Jesus wants us all to be hungry to do. While on earth, Jesus made it clear that he was most hungry to please God the Father. And guess what he said in John 8, 29, y'all? He said, I do everything that pleases him. He wanted to do everything that pleased his Father. That's what he was hungry for. Let me ask you, what are you hungry for? What are you honestly leaning toward, thinking about constantly, going to bed thinking about, waking up thinking about, praying for, talking to others about, thinking about on your car rides on a daily basis? What is it that you want most in life? I wanna tell you some good news this morning. You will please God every time you obey God. Simple statement, let me say it again. You will please God every time you obey God. So if you want to please God, obey him. You've got his pleasure every single time. But guess what? You will only please God when you hunger to please God. We can't do it by accident. It's not one of those natural talents we have. I don't know about you, but I don't roll out of bed obedient to God. I roll out of bed sometimes thinking, where did that thought come from? I roll out of bed sometimes thinking, hey, I just got up. Can you not test me, tempt me yet? Like, let me shower first, right? It's tough. But if you hunger to please God, obeying God becomes more of a possibility in your life. So if you hunger to please God, please be fueled by obedience to God. Secondly, if you hunger to please God, be humble while serving God. Be humble while serving God. Here's what Jesus says in John uh, John chapter four, verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. What's Jesus doing with this agricultural lesson right now? What is this? Well, what he's doing is he's reminding his disciples of what they already know. He's telling them, you guys know enough to read a a harvest in nature, the time to gather a a mature crop. You get that. And what I'm here to tell you, Jesus said, is that I understand when a spiritual harvest is on the horizon. I understand when people are ready to be harvested and gathered. And Jesus announced to his disciples that now is a time of harvest. It didn't look the same as it did in nature because in nature we can read the signs and the seasons, but Jesus can read hearts. Jesus can read eras and generations, and he knows the work that he's been doing since the foundation of the world, the work that he's been doing since he created Adam and Eve, the work that he's been doing since he came to earth through the Virgin Mary, and I'm telling you that he was announcing what he announced in his first words in scripture, Mark chapter one, verse 15, the kingdom of God is at hand. His sacrificial death and resurrection were right around the corner. They didn't know it, but it was. 
Peter's sermon on Pentecost and the dawn of the church age were right around the corner. They didn't know it, but he did. And guess what else? The time in history when the, when the people, the nations of the world would receive the words of God and begin to place their faith in the Son of God and serve the Son of God and, 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 and dwell in churches that, that built other churches and made disciples who made other disciples, that time was around the corner. They didn't know it yet, but it was coming. It was as if Jesus said to his disciples, it is time before Rafiki said it to Simba and the Lion King. You see, John chapter four, verse 36 and 38, Jesus goes on to explain more. He says, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. So that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here, the saying holds true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor, Others have labored and have entered into their labor. You see, Jesus was careful to clarify that his disciples were not the heroes of humanity's salvation. You see, God, we need to remind ourselves of this from time to time. God has worked through many, many people, generation after generation, to bring individual people into his kingdom. You might say, okay, why was this necessary to say? I'm sure that this clarification was both enlightening and humbling to his disciples who had at times revealed their struggles with, shall I say, arrogance. If you've read the Gospels a time or two, you've probably run into a couple of occasions where Jesus' disciples were in the middle of an argument and they weren't arguing over something they were real proud of when Jesus called them out for it. Luke chapter 22, verse 24 highlights one of those times and it tells us that they were arguing over who amongst them was the greatest. You're only arguing over who amongst you is the greatest if you are trying to elevate yourself into a place of higher prominence than others and saying, God's really lucky to have me. Y'all know that, right? Y'all wouldn't be saved if it weren't for me. Y'all know that, right? And Jesus said, I don't want you to get wrapped up in that. And here's a reason why. It's, it, it, it could be done with or without you. And that's not a dig. That's not shade. That's just the truth. God said, this is already going on and I want you to join the effort. It doesn't start with you, it starts with me, Jesus was saying. It won't end with you, it'll end with me. But this fact shouldn't have discouraged them and it shouldn't discourage us, why? Because Christian evangelism has always been meant to be a shared ministry among God's people from all times. It is not my thing, it is not your thing, it is not my people's thing or my church's thing or your people or your church's thing because guess what, y'all? We're gonna leave this place sometime in the, in the future and this world's gonna keep on spinning, which means ministry needs to keep on happening. And aren't we thankful that it's on Jesus' back and not ours because the world would live and die on us? So of course it's not been set up that way, but in our moments of pride, we can act that way. And Jesus was just trying to upend that to make sure that they were really serving the right Lord. See, we are not worthy. We need to remind ourselves of this every now and then. We are not worthy of being forgiven or redeemed. You know that, right? What we have, the greatest gift we could ever have, a gift that we have that we wouldn't even be able to think to ask God for if he hadn't thought of it first. Think about that for a second. If it weren't for God and the word of God, none of us would know we were lost. None of us would know there's a God. None of us would know that there is an opportunity for salvation to be redeemed and forgiven from the things that we've done wrong. Matter of fact, we wouldn't even know what wrong is and how to get right. Sometimes we just need to say, hey, thank you, Lord. I have something that I don't deserve. I have something that I don't deserve and I'm going to cherish it more. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. So we shouldn't feel entitled by that, nor should we feel entitled to be a part of God's work. So we, to be a part of God's evangelistic work is a privilege, not, a, not an area of entitlement. It is, God does not owe us. He does not need us. And that, once again, is not shade. It just speaks to his significance in our lesser significance. But he invites us in. What a kind God, what a generous God. What a God who thinks of everything, amen? You are only serving God when you are serving him humbly. I wanna say that again. You are only serving God when you are serving him humbly because guess what? If, you're, if you say you're serving God but you're not serving him humbly, oh, you're serving someone, it's just not God, is you. 
You see, you will only humbly serve God when you hunger to please God. Because if you're not hungering to please God, you have a hunger to please someone else, which means you want glory to go to someone else, which means you're not thinking about God and you're not thinking about his glory. You're probably thinking about you and your own glory. You see, if you hunger to please God, it's a great idea to be fueled by obedience of God. It's also a great idea to be humble while serving God. We can't forget who God is while serving God, right? A third thing, if you hunger to please God, be celebratory of every person God saves. Be celebratory of every person God saves. John chapter four, verses 39 through 41 gives us a great opportunity to see God's heart on this. It says, many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. This was her testimony. He told me all that I ever did. That's all the Bible gives us. I don't know if she said more, but they summed it up that way, that briefly, in that brief statement had this kind of impact. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. Disappointingly, much like the first two centuries of America's existence, women's voices Um, were not adequately respected during the time Jesus was ministering in in the first century. This is a problem. That is a flawed perspective that is born in the mind of a sinful person and it often plays out in sin-filled societies. And I love that Jesus is gonna come into this and remind us that devaluing anyone is not of God. Amen? Amen. In this text, Jesus sets this wrong perspective right, and he makes it clear that sowers and reapers in his kingdom work can be male or female. What what a concept, amen? Sowers and reapers can be male or female, to which someone would probably come right back and argue, "But, but, but God only works through the most respected though, right? God only works through the most educated, right? Through the most seasoned, through the most well-behaved, through the, pers- through the people with the cleanest past, right? Wrong, wrong. This woman was a member of a despised people group. More on that in a minute. But God used her anyway. This woman had been divorced several times. But God used her anyway. This woman had only been recently redeemed. She was a new Christian. No probationary period. Get after serving me. (laughs) But God used her anyway. And this woman had limited spiritual knowledge. Think about it. How much about the things of God could she know at this point in her faith journey? But God used her anyway. You see, many modern day Christians would probably look down on her, but not God. Not the God who made her, not the God who saved her, not the God who had good plans for her life. John chapter four tells us that this woman's newfound Christian faith and brief testimony led to, notice the word God's word uses, many people, many people from her community being, becoming Christians. It's a pretty legit testimony. That's a pretty awesome thing to have experienced. So for anyone who believes that God only uses uh, people who have great spiritual resumes, think again. God can use anyone he wants to, whenever and however he wants to. Amen? It's amazing that in just a few chapters of scripture in this gospel of John, Jesus, we find, has chosen both to use John the Baptist and this Samaritan woman to be servant leaders in his kingdom work. I mean, if you were to pick MVPs out of humanity in God's work so far in the ministry that's been revealed through four chapters, we've got John the Baptist and we've got this woman from Samaria. They probably wouldn't have both gotten MVP votes from you. John eating all them locusts, you're like, oh, he's sacrificing. John, you know, John, John going through all this and there's no doubt about that, his devotion to God's will for his life. But we would often skip over the one with the well and say, well, she's gotta be a Christian a little bit longer. She's gotta prove herself. She's gotta go to seminary first. God used them both to do exceptional work in his kingdom. Exceptional work. She has a story to tell that many of us will die without being able to tell. Not because God loves us any less, 
but because God wanted to make a point that I don't love any of y'all any more or any less than any other of y'all. I just love you. And I'll use you how I desire to, and that's my business to decide on. None of God's work is dependent on the greatness of people. All of God's work is dependent on the greatness of God. And let's not overlook the multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial peace to Jesus' training of his disciples here. Remember the harvest he talked about? You see, the harvest that he was referring to to his disciples in John chapter four, verse 35, he wasn't just referring to Jesus, Jewish people. He was referring to every shade of skin people possess. He was referring to every language people speak. He was referring to every nation people are affiliated with. Oh, this harvest was huge. You see, our Jewish savior, Jesus Christ, he broke with Israeli customs. And how did he do this? He, he, he encountered a Samaritan woman and he encountered her differently than a typical Jewish person would. He lovingly ministered to her. He gave her dignity, even though her testimony didn't have a lot of dignity to offer. In this Samaritan woman, what happened here with him ministering to her, he showed his disciples that the family of God is made up of both Jewish and non-Jewish people. You see, Samaritans, as our pastor, Pastor Scott, well described last week, Samaritans are like modern day biracial people. They were not of one ethnic background. They were partially Jewish, but unfortunately not Jewish enough to to earn the respect of all Jewish people. There were many Jewish people who hated them because they weren't fully Jewish. They were called, and I, I think this is one of the main reasons why Jesus went to a Jewish people and said, love your neighbors as yourself. These were closely related neighbors who were being treated like distant enemies. You see, Jesus informed his disciples then, and he is informing all of us now that he invites all of his children to participate in introducing him to all types of people. Did you hear that? Jesus wants all of his children to participate in introducing him to all types of people, which means the the, the thing we often go through when we see a person who may or may not know Jesus, we don't know until we engage them. Can I say that again? We don't know until we engage them. I'm telling you, the thing that the devil has going through our minds when we encounter a person with the, or when we think about should we encounter a person with the gospel is, how much like me does that person look? How, how much like my hobbies that I like are that person engaged in? How, how, what, what income level are they in compared to my income level? What, what accent do they use compared to my accent? We're going through all this stuff that Jesus said, don't go through that. I want all of my children to participate in introducing me to all types of people. If they're a person, they need Jesus. That's the criteria. Amen? All right, so aren't you grateful that our God, my God, your God, has created a kingdom that every age, every gender, every nationality, and every race can be adopted into? Aren't you grateful that that's the God we serve? Aren't you grateful that's the heaven we're going to? Amen? I'm so glad that God got the one and only vote because I'm telling y'all, I don't trust our votes. And I'm just saying that if God would have given us a vote, I think we would have voted that thing down. So glad our God is God. And Psalm 115, verse three says it so sweetly. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Let's carry on in this chapter. It's John chapter four, verse 42. It says the, the, the Samaritans said to this woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. They had just spent two days with Jesus Christ himself. They they heard a brief testimony from her, but then they spent two days with Jesus himself. Imagine this reality. So this is not just a hypothetical. This actually happened. A people group who experienced the multi-generational sting of being hated by another people group, being mistreated by another people group, they now encounter a person from that people group, and they're supposed to believe he's the Messiah from that people group? But then they meet him, and he looks at them, and he respects them, and he loves them, and he tells them they can be forgiven, and he tells them they can be redeemed, and it is so. What a moment in history. I'm reminded through this moment by 
19th century American abolitionists. You know, many of them were Christians. Not all of them, but many of them were Christians. And here's an ironic detail about that is many of them shared the same shade of skin as slave owners and slave catchers. So we had a dilemma on our hands. We had people who were saying they were they, they were different, but they looked like people who had hurt others. And guess what? They showed their difference. They lovingly, they loved and respect slaves, and they also helped slaves find freedom. Powerful. I'm also reminded of what a South Carolinian pastor did in 1996. His name was Reverend David Kennedy. He's a black man. And guess what? He sheltered and took care of a white former Ku Klux Klan member named Mike Burden. Mike Burden's life was in danger. He was homeless. He was kind of being hunted by members of the Klan for leaving the Klan. They were upset and they were threatening his life at every turn. A black reverend takes him in, shelters him, cares for him, helps him find a job, helps him get on his feet. Guess what else happened, y'all? He eventually led Mike to faith in Christ. He baptized him and they became lifelong friends. Only God, right? Only God. So what is the common denominator in these first century, 19th century, and 20th century stories that I've referred to? Jesus Christ. He's the common denominator. Every time something like this happens, it's because of him. He is the greatest evangelist, abolitionist, and liberator of all time. A Jewish man leading a Samaritan woman into the kingdom of God in the first century? Look at God. I mean, a Southern black preacher leading a Southern former white supremacist into the kingdom of God in 1996? Look at God. A multiracial, multilingual, multinational church in Louisville, Kentucky. Gospel-centered, amen? Singing praises to God. Loving and serving each other well at one of the most divided times in American history. Look at God, y'all. Look at God. Man, you will please God. You will. You will please God if you celebrate every person he saves. And you will only celebrate every person God saves if you long to please God. So grateful for our God. If you hunger to please God, I want to remind you, be fueled by obedience to God. If you hunger to please God, be humble while serving God. If you hunger to please God, be celebratory of every person God saves. And if you hunger to please God, be willing to believe God's words. Really quickly, I'm going to read these verses. John 4, 45. It says, so when Jesus came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him yesterday at the seventh hour, which is 1 p.m. And the fever left him. The father knew that this was the hour Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And guess what? He himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come to Judea of Galilee. Man, we shouldn't take for granted how generous Jesus was with his power. So generous with his power to do great things like life-saving miracles, a terminally sick boy healing him but to also do things that are kind of inconsequential, kind of unnecessary, but still encouraging, like turning water into wine at a wedding. Jesus did it all, but let's not make the mistake of thinking that Jesus, is only, Jesus only came here to do temporary things. He said in John 4, 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So what did God the Father send Jesus here to do? If it wasn't just to do little miracles like this, which were not little at all, but in comparison to what he did call him to do, they were little. This is what he actually called him here to do. First and foremost, Luke 4, 18 says that he was here to proclaim good news and liberty to the captives. 
Jesus' number one hope for coming here was for you and me to join his family and spend eternity with him. This doesn't mean Jesus performed any of his physical miracles grudgingly, but it does mean he performed his miracles strategically. John chapter four, verse 48, you notice that Jesus said it, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Jesus said, I've got a plan. The plan was to do this miracle, so what? Verse 50, go, your son will live. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken. What happened in verse 53? He believed. And that belief means a belief of faith. And the, his household believed as well. Jesus used a miracle as an evangelistic tool. He used his miraculous power as an evangelistic tool, and he often does it in your life and my life as well. Jesus blesses us to give us a boost into what? A boost into a better view of him and to initiate greater fellowship with him and greater faith in him. James chapter one, verse 17 says this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. God, what do you, what do, you do all these blessings for? Why do you bless us the way you do? Every God-authored blessing is meant to strengthen the bond between us and Jesus Christ. God doesn't do anything for nothing. So when he's blessing you, he's wanting to get closer to you. He's not just wanting to bless you and you just forget about it and pass on. He wants the blessing that you get from him to say, God, I love you more. I'm going to seek you more. I'm going to cling to you more. That's what he's doing. That's what he's up to. And guess what? What John 4 53 teaches us is that God-authored blessings can lead the people in our lives closer to him as well. Have you ever seen God use a blessing in your life to get somebody closer to him as well? Have you considered how he's blessed you and why he's blessed you and how it has benefited others around you? Let me use my life as an example. Just shortly ago, many of you know this story. In 2023, God blessed me with a new job, the Director of Biblical Unity at Christian Academy School System. It's located in Louisville, Kentucky, and also New Albany, Indiana. If you were to look at my story, you'd think, well, that's a nice blessing. It wasn't the only blessing. It was a setup for other blessings. That blessing found myself on the phone with a guy named Scott Long from North Carolina to Kentucky talking to a guy I'd never met about a church called Highview Baptist Church. It's Southside Campus, and, and when we moved my family from North Carolina to Kentucky, this became our church home immediately, first as visitors, but God had already confirmed before we move here, this is the place I want you to be, and we were right about what we were feeling God doing and is leading in his life, but that blessing set up another blessing. You see, through the blessing of this new church family, my daughter Sienna was able to attend the Summer Student Impact Week, where she placed her faith in Christ and became a child of God. Amen? I had no idea when I was interviewing for a job that God was saying, this is how I'm gonna get your daughter into the kingdom of God. No idea. How good is God? I love to ask that question because I also love to say, however good we think he is, he is even better. If you take God at his word, guess what you get? You get to see where belief in his word leads. One of the questions I hate in life is what if? You won't have to ask what if if you walk in obedience to God. God, what would have happened if I would have obeyed you? What would have happened if I would have walked with you? You get to see it. So the urging that you have from myself, the urging that you hear every week from Pastor Scott, the urging you will hear from Brother Aaron, the urging that you'll hear from Brother O.T. and others, your community group leaders and fellow believers on the phone, in text, the urging that you hear is because we all wanna see you see what God has for you, all of what God has for you. For Jesus' disciples, guess what they got to see? They got to see themselves become Christians and got to see all but one of them become amazing evangelists and missionaries. For a Samaritan woman, it led to her becoming a Christian. And it also led to her helping ignite a great awakening among her people. For a Jewish official, what did it do for him? It helped his son get healed. And it also helped him and every member of his household become Christians. What's it gonna be for you? Are you hungry to please God? 
Because I want to tell you this, God is hungry to mold you into the person he created you to be. God has a hope and a future for you, and he has good works to do through your life. Your life. There's a unique thing that he wants to do through you that he can't do through anybody else. It's only meant for you. Follow God's lead. It starts with asking for God's forgiveness in placing your faith in Jesus Christ. My friends, if you believe God's words, if you obey God's commands, if you serve God humbly, and if you celebrate every person God saves, you will live a full life. And may I also add, you'll live a very fulfilling life. And it's the life that God always intended you to live. All because you were most hungry to please God. Last question. What are you hungry for? Matthew chapter five, verse six says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be satisfied in life. So many of us are unsatisfied, unfulfilled, totally unimpressed with what life has to offer, but you, God, offer so much better. You offer actual fulfillment and satisfaction when we hunger for you, unlike this world. This world falls so short of giving us what we crave, but it promises it and fails at every turn. God, will you make us wholly dependent on you so that we won't trust in the fool's gold of the world any longer? God, we ought to seek to be pleased. We ought to seek to please you. Because if we're honest, Lord, if we look at what you've done for us and all that you want to do, truthfully, God, you're the only one who pleases us. So God, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which includes in every individual life. May all of what you want to do in all of our lives be done. And may we have a joy and a fulfillment and feel so satisfied so that when we say we're hungry, we'll say, I know, I know what can satisfy my hunger, God, and it's you. Thank you, God, for being worthy of that. Thank you, God, for actually accomplishing that, for actually being the fulfiller of that promise that you will fill us when we hunger for you. Jesus, you're good. May your will be done in Jesus' name, amen.